Praise, 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 praise the name of Jesus. We are grateful, I am grateful for this time uh, that uh, God has given us to share the word with you. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the man of God, Apostle Grace Vega, uh, the man that God has used to minister to us, the man that God has used to mentor us, the man that God has used to feed us with the word of God. And uh, he has taught us many things, and uh, each and every day there is something. There is something for us to enjoy or to receive. Praise the name of Jesus. Uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Mr. Alan Tizé. Thank you so much uh, for the work that you're doing with Jesper and the team and the people that are tuning in. We want to thank God for you that you, you know, put a time aside that you put the word of God above everything else, that you make time to attend to the word, to the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. That is beautiful. That is powerful. That is wonderful. It is encouraging that you make time for the word. Praise the name of the Lord. It just reminds me of one of the scriptures. I think uh, is it uh, uh, with Proverbs 11, verses around 9 or 19. The Bible talks about it says that so the, the righteous are delivered through knowledge. The righteous are delivered through knowledge. The righteous are delivered through knowledge. Is that the scripture? Just maybe somebody can look it up and uh, help me understand what it is, the scripture that we're talking about. But one thing that I love about the scripture is that place where, you know, that each principle actually has its power. Each principle that is set you know, that God put forward for us to, you know, to live with, is that each principle has what it fulfills in our lives, you know. You cannot put, uh, you, cannot use, you cannot use the principle prayer and fasting where you need knowledge, where you need to have knowledge. You know, it's one of the key things that you need because you can pray all that you want. You can fast all that you want. You can give all that you want. You, you can do all that you want. But if you're doing it out of knowledge, without knowledge, you know, sometimes you waste a lot of time in a place where you're not supposed to waste a lot of time. Otherwise, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to speak that which God has put on my heart as he brings it forward to us, the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. Okay, let me begin with another prayer in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to listen to you, to receive that which you're pouring out for us. We pray that you quicken us to receive it to the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. We thank you that it is good and wonderful in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And believe, praise the name of the Lord. I want to begin somewhere today as we talk about marriage. I know that on this subgroup we are, uh, you know, we are, we are, we are trying to, uh, to reach to different kinds of categories of people. There are those, you know, that are married already. There are those that are looking forward to get married. I'm going to follow this speaking as it comes. And each one of you will get what belongs to you as I speak to the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. To you that is married, you know how to apply it. To you that is not yet married, you know what to do. As we continue, praise the name of the Lord. So today, I want to begin from the book of Matthew, a common scripture that we know very, very well. Uh, the book of Matthew, and that is uh, chapter 11, uh, verses 29 to 30. It's just going to give us an introduction of what we're going to say, and uh, it will help us. Uh, with what we're going to discuss, 11 verses 29 uh, to 30. The New Kingdom's Version, the Bible says, it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This was Jesus speaking. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. It says, for I'm, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Praise the name of the Lord. We all know that, you know, Jesus is... That example is, is that person that has showed us how to live in many ways, in many things, and he has taught things, and you know, is our Lord and Savior, and we see that he has taught, he taught many things through his life, the things that we need to look forward to, the things that we need to emulate or imitate as we continue with our lives. So he says, take my yoke upon you 
and learn from me. I, I want to emphasize that last part where the Bible says, learn from me, for I am gentle and well in heart, and you will find rest. Now, the other line I want to emphasize is the place of finding rest for your soul. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, sometimes I tell people that it is pride to want to do, you know, differently what, uh, from what actually was instructed, the way that God put forward uh, this wisdom to us. But sometimes some people want to do things their own way. Uh, uh, that is above or beyond or in another way, or which is not directly uh, referring to the scripture or, you know, through what the scripture says. At the end of the day, you find that the results or the consequences are not the same. You know, this is a place where the Bible is talking about rest for our souls, you know. I know that throughout life, many people look for that place where they will find rest. Of course, we can talk about the area of salvation, but you know, when you get born again, there's that, you know, rest in your soul. But it sometimes doesn't stop there, because as we progress into our Christian walk, if you find yourself in a place that there are things that you don't know, still you find a place where you don't have rest. And you find people getting married or getting into marriage, and they, they are not rested. They are in their marriage, but they are not rested. They, they, they want to find that right uh, partner, but they are not rested. They are in a relationship, but they are not rested. Praise the name of the Lord. Sometimes because we are not learning from Jesus Christ, Praise the name of Jesus. So when we learn from Jesus, prayers will help us. Now, I want to begin from one of the examples of our Lord Jesus Christ as we talk about marriage and the many things to do with family. I want to go to the book of John, chapter 21. Chapter 21, um, from verses 1 to 13. I will not read there. Most probably we put the scripture there. When you find time, you read the scripture. John, chapter uh, 21, verses 1 to 13. The message version. It is a place actually where you find Jesus, you know, preparing food. He was preparing food for the disciples. Now, this is Jesus Christ, okay, the man from above, okay, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, the man full of power, anointing, grace, and everything that you know. But when you look at him, you know, providing uh, or cooking or preparing breakfast for his disciples, you would expect him not to Think of doing that, most probably, to just tell someone, man, someone as a leader, as a, a man of God, as a savior, as a king, as the Lord of Lords, and say, ah, prepare that kind of breakfast for the disciples. Now, if you read the story, you find that these guys had gone fishing, and when they did go for fishing, they, you know, it came in the morning and they did not get anything. And uh, they were tired because the whole night they were tired. In other words, what was expected of them, or to find in the morning, is to find someone must be making breakfast for them, something that they needed to eat because all night they were in the lake trying to find fish. You know, I mean that paints the picture to us of how Jesus cares for even the small things that we think they are small. Now this is one of the things that I want to put forward as we discuss what we're going to discuss, that uh, if we talk about marriage, it is important to know this part of marriage. It's important to know this part, that you, you as you enter marriage, it is important that you understand it. When you understand it, you enjoy marriage. You have a happy marriage. You will be happy for the rest of your life in the name of Jesus. You know, when you go to the book of Malachi, uh, chapter uh, 2 and um, verses 15, again in the message version. Malachi chapter 2, verses 15 in the message version. The Bible says, I love this scripture so much. The Bible says, God made marriage and his spirit inhabits. You know, you know, he's, he, what it talks about that he, he's interested. I'm not reading the scripture here, but I'm paraphrasing. The, the, the scripture talks about how He's interested in the smallest details of marriage. He's interested in the smallest details of his marriage. And he says, guard the spirit of marriage. And then he says, do not cheat on your spouse. There are many things in there. But what I wanted to look to, to this scripture, is that place where God is interested in the smallest details. Now, 
if we talk about God being interested in small things, that people may think they are small in marriage, it is important that even you as an individual, as you think about getting married, it is something that you must consider. It's something that you must look forward to. You know, now, when the Bible says don't cheat on your spouse, I always tell people that cheating is not about adultery. Yes, adultery could be one of them. But cheating is simply a place where you fail to do what you are supposed to do. And one of the places is that place where you serve one another. I'll come to the scripture. Now, going back to the John 21, where Jesus, you know, he, 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 he knew what these guys have gone through, you know, throughout the night and so on and so forth. And he understood these guys when they come in the morning, they will make something to eat. And then he prepares breakfast for them. Hallelujah. Now, that is something that looks to be small, but it is important or it shows us something that actually he came to serve, as it says in the scripture. Because if you go in the book of John, that is chapter 13, John chapter 13, from verses 13, 15, Again, we see Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. So he washes the feet of his disciples. And when he was washing the feet of his disciples, one of the lessons that he teaches here is the place of serving. You know, of course, we serve from different capacities here and there and so on and so forth. Uh, I always tell people that if you're still single and you, you, you one day you, 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 you're looking forward to getting married, one of the things you must learn is to serve. Because... In marriage, one of the things that is so important and that is, you know, a ministry to one another is that place where you serve one another effectively. For the years, as I've been uh, married and I've been a counselor for couples that come and, you know, uh, this one thing has come forth. This one thing has always come on my table. Uh, and people are complaining and they complain, okay, my husband doesn't do this, doesn't do this, doesn't do this, doesn't do this. And then the wife comes and says, okay. Many of the husband also says, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do this. And others say, at the end of the day, it is a place of serving one another. That place where you, you feel this is your partner. And they, 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 they are in the place where they are supposed to understand you better. And they in the place where they are supposed to minister to you a certain way. But sometimes you find that one of them wants to be ministered to, to a certain way, and then they leave out the other, maybe uh, looking at the or thinking they have a right to be served, you know, but they have a right to serve the other. Look at that. So problems have always been around there. My husband doesn't do this. My wife doesn't do this. You know, one party always the men. Sometimes they have that place of having a certain way to be served a certain way. Uh, and then uh, also the women in some areas, you know, they have a right. They, they, they have a mind or an attitude of, a certain, of certain things that actually these men must do this. And if they don't do this, you know, I, I cannot be happy. If they don't do this, I'll not do this. If they don't do this, you know, I'll not do this. If they don't do this, I'll not do this. So marriage becomes the place of, okay, when they do this, then I'll do this. You know, you understand? No, this is my right, that is my right. This is my right, that's my right. And, and, and at the end of the day, that is where things are. And then you find people that have not found this. And you find people in a place where they have not enjoyed their marriages because of, one thing, they have not understood the place of serving one another. Now, as I talk about how Jesus, you know, was the feet, the feet of the disciples to the place and the point that he was teaching one of the greatest uh, principles, you know, of his life and the thing that he came to teach the world. And he told them, if you want to be the greatest, serve one another. If you want to be the greatest, serve one another. You know, to begin with, if you're a single person and you ever think that one day you're going to get married, learn to serve. Serve people. You know, every opportunity that you have to serve somebody, serve them. You know, I love the place where, I love the place of the reward that comes with serving. You know, because Jesus served, because he served a certain way, you know, he left all the glory from heaven and he came on earth. And because he came on earth, he chose to put on flesh. And when he put on flesh, it was the flesh where he had to die for man, to take the sins of man, you know, to take away the sickness of man, to take away all the things that were against humanity. You know, he sacrificed himself for man. 
for human beings, for us, praise the name of the Lord. It's a place where he serves. And in Philippians, the Bible says God gave him a name above all other names. You see that? That he gave him a name above all other names. Look at that girl. Look, look at that at, at, at us reward. That he gave him a name above all other names. That, at the mention of that name, every name shall bow and every time will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What am I saying? Sometimes in the world where we live, if you serve, some people see or they want to, they look at you as one who is, you know what? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the word for it, but they want to to take advantage of you. In other words, if you serve, it's like if you serve your nobody, if you, you're serving, you, are, you don't have anything. If you're serving, I mean, the conversation about serving to some people, they think it's a place, it's a lower place. It's a place of being a slave, being of a lower standard, and so on and so forth. But Jesus shows us how. He shows us actually the way, you know, to impact life, the way to change life, the way, you know, to, 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 to minister to one another is the place of serving. And therefore, one of the definitions of the scriptures about marriage, I love this scripture so much. I love this scripture so much. This one we read in the book of 1 Corinthians. In the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 4. Verses 4 in the message version. I love the scripture. I'm just laying the foundation of the things that I'm going to say. Now, in this uh, scripture, the Bible says, marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. It says marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. You know? Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. I repeat this over and over so that some people get it. The Bible says marriage is a decision. It's a decision to serve the other. It's a decision to serve the other. Whether in bed or out of bed. Whether in bed or out of bed. Praise the name of the Lord. If you read it in the New King James Version, uh, the Bible is talking about, it says, the wife does not have authority over her own body. The, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over her own body, but the wife does. Now, when the Bible talks about you having no authority over your body, it's talking about that place where when you get married, you give out all it to your body. I tell people that that body from the day you say, I do, doesn't belong to you anymore. And now, of course, in the primary interpretation of this scripture, they were talking about Holy Communion. Okay, if you understand our language, that is Holy Communion, because I don't know the people that are listening in. But if you understand that language, you're not talking about only Holy Communion, because it is the primary interpretation of the scripture, but it is not limited to that. Because on your body, there are hands, on your body, you have legs, on your body, you have eyes, you have ears. Praise the name of the Lord. In other words, if your body belongs to your wife, your man of God, husband. It means that your wife has the right to ask you to help her into anything. It means that your husband has the right to send that hand of yours to bring him something. It means that your wife has the right over that leg, your leg, to send it somewhere to get them something because they are in need of something. Of course, I don't want to go into every of the community. We'll talk about that maybe another day. I wanted to talk about majorly to the, the place of serving. So the Bible says that marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights, but marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out of bed. Praise the name of the Lord. Of course, people they enjoy, especially men, maybe the service in bed, but most of them may not want the service out of bed. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. So I emphasize this. If you are married, one of the things that you must make up your mind to do is to serve your partner, to serve them in any way possible, to serve them until they feel they are served. Praise the name of the Lord. That body belongs to them. Whenever they want to send that body, please be available and go and do that thing that you require that you do. Now, this is again a sum of the culture beliefs or what culture teaches about 
the role of a man and the role of a husband, you know, they come to that place where they divide. This is the role of a man. This is the role of a husband. But if you look at the scripture, you find that, yes, there are those roles of a wife and the roles of a husband, but they are not exclusive in themselves. Praise the name of the Lord. But actually, when we look up, uh, about talking about a homemaker, that actually wife is a homemaker, it doesn't mean that a man cannot do so, or it doesn't mean that a man cannot help. When we look at the place where we say that, okay, the husband is the provider, it doesn't mean that he is the sole provider. It doesn't mean that he cannot be helped in providing for the home. You see what I'm talking about. But if you come to cultures, you find places where they're like, oh, a man doesn't do that. A man doesn't do this. A man doesn't do that. Oh, a woman doesn't do that. A woman, no, this is totally different from the spiritual perspective. Because when we get born again, we take on the nature of Jesus Christ. We are of a good nature. We are of a God culture. Our culture changes. Our culture is of God. Of course, we respect culture where it is good because we know that everything that is good is of God. Hallelujah. Everything that is good is of God. So if it is good, praise the name of the Lord, like in different cultures, they show respect differently. And it is good to show respect. The place where is respect. But different cultures show it differently. And therefore, if that is the way culture shows respect, well and good, it can go. But we want to keep the principle. The principle here is the place of serving. I always tell my couples that if your partner, uh, uh, if you're not the first person that your partner consults, or feel free to talk to, or feel free to discuss any matter with, with you, you know, there's something wrong that you need to fix. You know, because when the Bible says the two shall become one, the Bible says two shall become one. You are one, one flesh. Of course, it's not one spirit, it's one flesh. Praise the name of the Lord. But that oneness is, is, is very, very important because there are two places in the scripture, the oneness with Christ Jesus and the oneness with your wife or your husband. You know, when we talk about the place of companionship, especially when we come to, of course, when we read the Bible in the book of the Ecclesiastes, but it is just a chapter, uh, uh, let's look at chapter uh, 4, verses 9, in the message version. Verses 9, in the message version. The Bible says, we read 9, let's probably to 12. The Bible says, it is better to have a partner than go eat alone. It is better to have a partner than go eat alone. You know, you don't fight this. You, you can't go against this. God in his wisdom, you know, he knew that it's better, it's better, it's better, it's, it's better to have a partner than to go eat alone. The Bible says, share the work, praise God. Share what? The work. It says, share the work, share the wealth, share the work, share the wealth. And it says, and if one falls down, okay, that's powerful, the other helps. But if there is no one to help, tough, <laughs> those things are tough. It says, two in a bed warm each other alone you shiver all night by yourself you are unprotected with a friend you can face the worst hallelujah can you round up a third and a, a third and a three stranded rope it is even easily snapped praise the name of Jesus now you look at this place it's talking about a place of a companion it's talking about that place where your partner is it is that person, it is that friend of yours that if there is anything you need, if anything that you, you talk, you, you, you think about, if anything that you want to do, if there is anything that you want to say, they feel comfortable and you are the first person they can say that thing to. You are the first person they can think about. You are the first person that they can feel comfortable to send to help them. Now, this goes deep. Remember I talked about the small details? goes deep into, you know, uh, things around home, but also goes deep into the things, you know, to do with work, to do with career, to do with everything around life. Praise the name of Jesus. So when the Bible says that marriage is a place to serve one another, it is a place to serve one another, it is a decision. It is important to know that this is a decision. The, 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 the place that Papa calls, uh, that is the level, or a stage where a human being is ready to commit. It speaks about a place of, you know, human beings going three stages. Firstly, the stage of imitation. 
and then the stage of discovery, and then the stage of committing, not being able to commit. It is bad or it is not right for a person to begin to commit into marriage when they have not actually discovered who they are. If you haven't discovered who you are and, and, and what you are called to do, it is not the right time for you to think about marriage because you go into marriage and you still want to, to do discoveries. <laughs> when you go into marriage and you want to be discovered, you will not know what to do at the end of the day. Now, I want to go to another scripture in the book of Hebrews as I speak about this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Oh, my God, I don't know this one. Okay, Hebrews 10, verses 24. Hebrews 10, 24. We are going to read the amplified version. Hebrews 10, 24, the amplified version. Now, the Bible says, and let us consider and give attentive. Let us consider and give attentive continuous care to watch over one another. He says, and let us consider and give attentive, you know, give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another. The Bible says, studying how we may stir up, you know, stimulate and entice to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, when you look at this scripture, it's talking about a place where you are. You must be intentional. You must be intentional. You must be intentional. It's not something that uh, simply just falls on you. You understand what I'm saying? What am I trying to say here? We know that love goes through stages. We know that love grows. And we know that love dies. Let us not even talk about that. But let's first talk about this small, small the other love that we talk about, the 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 world, uh, the else love, you know, the gay love. But in this particular topic today, most probably we'll be talking about the else love, as we say. Of course, agape is the center of all these ones. Now, when we talk about, you know, when the scripture says, let us consider and give attentive and continuous care to watching over one another, and the Bible says, studying how we may stir up love. I mean, this is intentional. And it's calling upon a place of studying. Hallelujah. It is something that you need to look forward to as a married couple. <laughs> Ooh, I had the story of a, of, 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 a, of a certain gentleman that uh, from the day he said to his <laughs> wife that he loves her, that was the last time. And the time came and the, the wife asked her and says that, do you love me? And the gentleman turned to the lady and said, if I did love you, I would have told you that I don't love you. Because the first time I told they I love you, I meant it. Now I don't need to tell you. <laughs> now, we are looking at two different people, created differently. Women created differently and men created differently. But that today in one of the, uh, the, 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 the wedding words, we didn't talk about the areas of men being different from women and so on and so forth. But I don't want to go into that. But we are talking about a place of studying how to, you may stay at large. Sometimes some marriages, uh, after they get married because they said I love one another and so on and so forth, they, they give us. I says, ah, I married you, but married to me, of course, that is enough. I love you. And then they take things for granted. But this is a present continuous tense. It's something that you are going to do for the rest of your life as long as you are married. You need to study how you keep on staring up that love. You know, to help. And the, the, the Bible says to love and helpful deeds and noble activity. Now, this scripture in the message says, in the message the Bible says, let us see how inventive let us see how inventive let us see how inventive we can be in encouraging love in encouraging love and helping out <laughs> in other words it requires innovation oh to keep the fire in marriage it requires that innovation to keep the fire in marriage praise the name of the lord you need to know how to do it you need to study how to do it that means you need to know your partner, you need to understand your partner, you need to know how to minister to them a certain way. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I want to, I want to go to, I want to go to the scripture in the book of Ephesians uh, that I want to talk about uh, today, uh, majorly, 
uh, I've been just speaking about the background of the things actually that I wanted to say. But let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 21. We're going to read the New King James Version to begin with. Now, this is one of the ways that we minister to one another. Some of the things we don't we take for granted, or some of the things that we don't know, some of the things we don't take time to build and uh, 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 to make sure we, we understand what uh, we are in. Now, the Bible says in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, when you look, read this scripture, you find that actually the primary interpretation of the scriptures down there, Apostle was talking about, Apostle Paul was talking about marriage. And because he was talking about marriage, we will see a lot of things relating to marriage. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us go in that dimension. Of course, that is not the only dimension that we're going to talk about. It's not the only place. Uh, uh, where the scripture is, is coming from, but we want to take that line because, you know, the context took, takes that line to begin with. So the Bible says, submitting to one another in the fear of God, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So I want to talk about submitting, or submitting to one another, or submission in marriage. Praise the name of Jesus Okay, many times when we, we talk about the word submission, some people think of it's what? They think, oh, it's what, 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 and so on and so forth, and uh, they, they don't know. But I want to break this down a bit for us to be able to appreciate and understand. You know, if you try to go in the, in the dictionaries to find out actually what submission is, it's simply a place of, you know, uh, uh, one, uh, that is uh, one um, uh, it is a place of reverence to God to begin with, an act of showing respect, no matter in a sacred context. Okay, but if we go in a simple definition of defining what uh, submission is, it's simply the act, the act of yielding, it's simply the act of yielding, or giving in, or surrender, or putting into consideration. You know, in the marriage context, that is yielding to the suggestion, reasoning, insight of the other as long as they are godly. Praise the name of the Lord. That is also important to add on. You know, we are talking about a place of yielding to the suggestions, to the reasonings, to the insight of the other as long as they are godly. Hallelujah. Now, there are many reasons the scriptures give us why we shall submit to one another. Now, the scripture says, has done submit to your wife, wife submit to your husband. Majorly, some people jump to verses 22 where they say, wife submit to your own husband as unto the Lord, and they leave out the place where men, or men are supposed to submit to your wives, you know. What reason does scripture actually give, you know, why we should submit to one another? One is that we are joined hairs of the grace of God in the book of First Peter chapter 3, you know, verses 7, the Bible talks about joined hairship. Because your joint hairship, it is important to understand that it is very key to submit to one another, you know, to view the suggestion, the reason, the insight of the other as long as they are good enough. Somebody will ask me, how do I know that the insight, the reasoning, the suggestions of my partner are godly so that I come to that place of being able to submit? Simple. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, before I come back to Ephesians, James 3 verses 17 says something. James chapter 3 and verse 17, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that the wisdom that is from above is firstly pure. You know, if your friend, your partner, they are speaking something that is pure, you know, and then peaceable, and then gentle, and willing to eat, okay, full of mercy and of good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You know, this is one of the scriptures that can help you to know where to know what is from above, what is with God, what is of God. 
when you look at what suggestions the reason the insight your partner is putting on the table you know it doesn't matter whether they, they favor you or they don't favor you as long as they pass this test it is important that as a man of God, a woman of God, you listen very carefully. Why? You are joint heirs with the grace of life because God does not look at you as two, but He looks at you as one. And because He looks at you as one, He can speak to any of you anytime concerning your future. It means you are doing life together. You know, you, when you get married, life does not remain the same. <laughs> Many things coming. The place of giving accountability to, to your partner, the place of being transparent to your partner, the place of caring for one another, you know, serving one another, all those things come there. Now, when the Bible says the two, uh, when the Bible uh, talks about a place of, of, of being able to submit to one another, to the insight, the suggestion, the insight of the other, because you are doing life together. From the day you say, I do life is not the same. Your partner is part of your story. Your success is her success. Your failure is her failure. She's part of that journey. And because she's part of that journey, and she's the daughter of God, remember before she's united to you, praise the name of the Lord, she's united to the Lord. She's the daughter of the Most High God. Before that man is united to you, the first is united with God. God speaks to him and speaks to her any time, you know, concerning her life and many other things, the assignments that God gives us as we serve him, as we, we accept him as our Lord and Savior. You know, he did just create us, but he created us for reasons, for a lot of things. And in there is the place where God speaks to us. So now that you are two, you know, one of the reasons why marriage is a place of serving God better, Two is the place of serving one another. Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about. But the first one, the place of serving God better. You know, it is very key that in your marriage you know and understand that is a place of service. You know, serving God, but also serving one another. And as you do serve one another, or you do serve God, you must know firstly that these people are joined with the Lord and so they hear God and so their lives are in the hand of God and therefore God speaks to them a certain way and no you know God wants to minister to them a certain way and when they come forward to say something you need to listen is it from above you know before you brush it off I'm talking about a place of serving one another this is one of the major places why you must learn to serve one another a place where you agree, a place where you you, you, you you listen to and submit to the insight, the suggestion, the reasoning. Again, I want to emphasize this. You are not doing this life alone. She's part of that story. You are part of that story. Her success is your success. Her failure is your failure. You know, your inheritance is tied together. Praise the name of Jesus. And because of that, we can look at many examples through the scriptures where God, you know, sometimes we, uh, I may not speak about the place of men, we know all throughout the scripture, God speaking to men, different areas and different things of life. I want to speak major now to areas and places, must be to help some people where God actually spoke very important information to actually women. Think that we are shaping destinies. Hallelujah. Let us begin from the book of Genesis. Let us look at Sarah in Genesis chapter 21. In Genesis chapter 21, when we look at verses 1 to 12, we are going to read the amplified version. There is something that is very interesting here. Genesis chapter 21. 21. Uh, we said verses 1 to 12 amplified. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for her he had promised. For Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At the same time, God had told him, Abraham named, God had told him, Abraham named his son, whom Sarah, Sarah bore, to him Isaac, and said, Laughter, and brought laughter. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham, Abraham was a 
a hundred years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. All who hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would not children of the best? For I have born him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar. This is where the point is. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking Isaac. Where is the name of the Lord? Verse 7. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this born woman and her son, for the son of this born woman shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very grievous, serious, evil in Abraham's sight on account of his son Ishmael. 12. The Bible says, God said to Abraham, Do not let it seem grievous and evil to you because of the youth and your born woman. In all that Sarah has said to you, do what she asks. For in Isaac shall your prosperity be called. Now, this was something very hard for Abraham. Now, Sarah is saying, okay, cast out Ishmael. Now, this is the seed of Abraham, <laughs> you know, and, 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 he's telling, and Sarah is telling her, cast out the woman and the child. It was hard. You know, Abraham could not just, <laughs> just do what Sarah was saying, but... Thank God that Abraham was a man of God. That Abraham listened to God. That Abraham most probably went and inquired to the Lord. When the Bible says that after the thing that she said was very grievous, serious, and evil, I don't know what things that Abraham began to think about this woman. You know, he was thinking about the place where Sarah is the one who brought Agar, you know, and all those kinds of things, and all those kinds of things, and all those kinds of things. And whatever happened, it was a result of Sarah. And now, the very woman who brought Hagar is the very woman who says, cast her out and the son. Now that Ishmael is the seed of Abraham, of Abraham, look at that, it wasn't easy. But one thing that we see in the scripture here, to show us how God deals with a marriage couple, that the seed that was discovered in Abraham, God actually spoke to Sarah of what should be done. And Sarah spoke to Abraham, and when she spoke to Abraham, it was hard for Abraham, but you know, when Abraham went to God, God, what can I do, and so on and so forth, he said, just go and do what your wife is saying. Now, listen to that. Listen to that. Now, these are examples of things that I'm trying to show you, what it means to submit one another, that God can speak to any one of you, but in the place of speaking to any one of you, or that's the place that calls you to submit one another, to yield to the, to the suggestions, to yield to the insight, you know, to yield to the reason of the other. I said as long as they are godly, you know, as long as their suggestions, their, their thoughts, their insight pass the tests of being godly. You know, today Papa was talking about the place of love, and he was talking about that love is above the three, faith and hope. Love is above I said, there are things, <laughs> oh, you see, it doesn't matter how much faith you have. If there is no love in the faith, the things of faith that you want to do in your home, those things actually may even cause trouble. You're trying to be a person of faith, and a man of faith, and the woman of faith. And so you want to put faith before love. In other words, okay, there are things that you're going to do in marriage, there are things that you're going to do in life because of love. When you understand, when you have the revelation of what love is, to begin with agape, when you have a revelation of what love is, what agape is, you will serve one another. You will listen to one another. You will to one another. You will come to the place of one good man. You know, there are things that men have done or women have done in the name of faith in their marriages. You know, because they have faith for something. They go ahead and then they leave their partners in a place where they can't understand them, they are grumbling, they are crying, they are grieving, because for them they are going by faith, not by love. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, look at what Abraham did. And look at what happened to Abraham and Sarah. This is the marriage of our father Abraham, you know, where we all come from. But God has to pass, had to pass something to the one. Because we have another example that we can look to in, in the book of, of, of Genesis chapter 25. In the book of Genesis chapter 25, 
let's read that one. And let's better go to another point. Genesis chapter 25. I see my time is running. 25 from verses uh, uh, 21. The New King James Version. 25 verses 21 to 23. Uh, verses 21. The Bible says it's talking about Isaac and Rebecca. It's talking about another marriage here. And says, and Isaac prayed much to the Lord for his wife, for his wife, because she was unable to bear children. There is the name of the Lord. Isaac, the priest man, prayed. And then he prays, and the Lord granted his prayer. Hallelujah. And Rebecca, his wife, became pregnant. Two children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so that the Lord, hey, that's amplified. Okay, let me read the New King James Version to help me quicker. Okay. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Hallelujah. I love this marriage. Isaac goes to the Lord and speaks to the Lord about the, the situation. The wife was being barren, and she conceived. And now also the wife, carrying the pregnancy, she begins to experience certain things, the struggle in her belly. And then she goes to inquire from the Lord, you know. That's why she would have gone back to her husband and asked him. I don't want to go into that. But she went to the Lord. When we talk about certain priorities in marriage, that place where every one of us have a personal relationship, a personal space, a personal place with God. And it is very key and important in marriage or in your life. If you're a single person, you must have a place where you hear God. Sometimes I tell singles that if you didn't hear God about anything in your life, how do you want God to speak to you in the place of getting married? And like I want God to speak to me, oh, I want to hear God, and then some of some people come and then they say, oh, I've had God, but you, you never had God in many other things in your life. You don't know even how He speaks. You've never cultivated that place and relationship. How would you hear God when it comes to your marriage? Praise the name of the Lord. So cultivate that place. So we look at this couple that they actually have this place with God. They cultivated this place with God and helped them a lot. But actually Sarah goes back to God and says, what is happening? Now listen. Isaac prayed for the wife, and the wife who was barren got pregnant. But when the wife goes to ask what is happening, the Lord opens up and begins to talk to Sarah, to Rebecca. Sorry, Rebecca, sorry. 23. The Bible says, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Look at that precious information. Two people shall be separate from your womb. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the other shall serve the younger. Okay? So when her days were fulfilled for her to give back. Indeed, they were twins. He said, we're going to reach verses 23. Now, I want us to jump to chapter 27 of Genesis. Chapter 27 of Genesis, so that I can explain. Chapter 27 of Genesis, from verses 1 to 13. This is where the big story is. The Bible says, now it came to pass, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me several food, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, "Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make some food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now." to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of God, and I will make some food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it, and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a snake-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feed me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go get them. 
from me. Now you can read on and read on. But what I wanted to bring out is this. God spoke to Rebecca about the destinies of the children. And I believe that when God spoke to Rebecca about the destinies of the children, that Rebecca spoke to Isaac about it. But Isaac somehow, somewhere, he did not listen. He didn't want to listen to what the woman was saying. You know, when she inquired of the Lord what was the struggle in her womb, and then the Lord began to give her information about the destinies of these two sons of hers, you know, who is going to be, you know, the heir and so on and so forth. It, 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 it came to that place that Jacob remained with the mind of uh, the, 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 the customs of the Jews, because according to custom, it was that obvious, it was that obvious that actually the firstborn must be there. You know, must take the first blessing, must take the blessing. And there was that custom, there was that tradition. And Jacob was bent, you know, to that kind of tradition. Praise the name of the Lord. He was bent to that kind of tradition. And therefore, he wanted to go ahead with it to bless Esau instead of Jacob. Oh, sorry, I'm saying Jacob. That was Isaac, sorry. Jacob, Isaac was bent. Sorry for mixing the names. Isaac was bent to follow the traditions of, you know, praying for the firstborn and then and so on and so forth. But according to God, there is something else that he was establishing. There is something that he said. There is something that he wanted. There is something that he looked forward to do. And God spoke this information to Rebecca. And now Rebecca has all the boldness at such a time to tell Jacob. That if there is a curse, let it, let it land on me. Why? Because she had for God. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, that place is so beautiful where you hear from God. What am I trying to say? Is the place that your husband or your wife, both of you, you are children of the most high God. You have a relationship with God. You must cultivate this relationship with God. A place where you both of you listen and hear God. When there is anything to discuss, you are able to put it forward. You are able to say what God told you. You are able to bring out that wisdom so that you miss, don't miss out that important information. Now, if Rebecca was not there, if Rebecca didn't do what she was supposed to do, probably Isaac would have gone ahead with what he wanted to do and we have a different story. I don't know where the story would end. But according to the mind of God, Rebecca had to do something and God backed her up. He backed her up. He backed her up. Now, some traditions, you know, or cultures, what they say to women, and say, ah, women don't speak, they simply obey, they simply do what they simply, you know, many other things that come in. Uh, I, I don't want to go into deep of that things, but my point here is, love to listen to the suggestion, the insight, the reason or the other. Their aim is God. You're one with your partner. You, your partner. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 22. Ephesians chapter 22, uh, the second dimension, because I've been discussing the first dimension of submission, a place of ministering to one another, a place of serving to one another. Now, when we go to the second dimension uh, uh, of, of submission uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, and verses chapter 5, not 2, chapter 5, and verses 22, 22. This is what the Bible says. Okay. The Bible says, Wives, submit your own husbands as unto the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I need to bring this point forward, but I see my time is almost up. I don't know whether, uh, Mr. Allen, uh, you add me some time to bring this. Uh, hello? Uh, I, I, yes, man, go, please go ahead. Thank you so much. So when you look at Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, you talk about uh, chapter 5, verses 20, the Bible says, Wives, submit your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is the second dimension, the second dimension, the second level of submission. Now, the first level of submission is a place where, you know, you listen, you yield, you, 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 you know, you, you, keep, you yield to the suggestions, the insights, and the reason of the other. But in the second uh, dimension of submission is the place where, as a wife, you allow your husband to lead. Now, 
you may make a mistake to think because 21 says summon to one another in the fear of the Lord, you think even 22 means the same. No, there's a difference. Yes, that place is important. But when it comes to the second dimension of submission, is the place where the Bible is simply saying that as a wife, when you bring your suggestion, when you put your insights, or when you put your reasoning at the table, okay? Let the man, let your husband as the head. If you have something that you want to bring forward, if you have something that you feel God has spoken to you, if you have something that you, you, you know, you've read the scriptures and the right way to go, or it's, there are certain principles that you see that your husband is not doing and you want to speak to them a certain way, you need first of all wisdom to do so. But two, you need to give them that place as the leaders to make the final decision if you are fair to agree. If they not listen to you at that particular place, you need to allow them to make the final decision. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody ask a question, what if they are making the wrong decision? Go to God and pray. If that man knows God, if that man has God, that's why we say, that's why the Bible does not allow us to marry people who are unbelievers. The Bible tells us to marry believers, get married to believers. That's why we always tell people, don't marry an unbeliever. The person who doesn't know God, praise the name of the Lord. To the place of, it's also not good to go with people who are still young in salvation. And then you commit in the things of marriage. They must have attained a certain level in their relation to Christ Jesus. You know, uh, they must have reached somewhere in the place of obedience and in the place of, rev of giving reverence to God. Because many things later on require that you're not a novice in the things of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, as is the things in marriage. So, wisdom is needed, wisdom is required. So the place of, okay, what if I see my husband going the wrong direction, going the wrong way, he's choosing a wrong thing to do, and it's going to affect all of us. So it's going to affect all of you. Because every step that you take when you're married, one of you take will affect both of you. You know, <laughs> I tell people that if your husband wakes up in the morning and refuses to eat and is not fasting, it will trouble you. Why are they not eating if they are not fasting? That alone troubles me, you see. They trouble you, they are not eating, they're, but they are not fasting. Why? You get what I'm saying? In other words, if there's anything that is, okay, let me say, if there's something that is shameful that comes on one of you, whether you want it or not, it will rub off you. It will come to you. People begin to ask the question, who is the husband of this woman? Who is the, 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 the wife of this man? Hey, no, yes, who is the wife of this man? Hey? Some people begin to say, okay, I pity that woman, I pity that man, you know, because one of you have done something that is very shameful, you know. You are not there. You did whatever you did, you are not there. They made whatever they you know, whatever they did, you are not there, but it's still to rub off that woman of God. It's still rub off to that man of God. So marriage, that's why it requires accountability. It requires accountability to one another so that we know where we are going. We know we are walking the right path. We know we are taking the right decisions because it is, the life is not the same. So we are looking at this place where, okay, the husband is going the wrong way, but you have spoken to him. You have seen something and you put it on the table and say, my husband, honey, wife, whatever name you call them, from what I'm saying, let, let us not go in this deal. This deal, I don't feel comfortable with this deal. And then the husband says, ah, this deal is so super. Bad so maybe they turn me out, it is so good, it's so beautiful. So we are going to make money, oh, we are going to do this. It's powerful, it's nice. And then you are telling, no, I don't feel right about it. And they don't listen. You know, in the second dimension of submission, where you submit to your head, or to your leader, or to those above you, praise the name of God. What do you do? In the first place, you pray for them. That's why the Bible actually tells us to pray for those that are in authority. So you pray for them, pray for them, you pray for them. You go to God and say, God, you gave me this man. But from what I'm seeing, what he wants to go with, what he, he, he wants to do in this particular area of this and that and that and that, I see he's going the wrong way. 
my father do something, you know, fix it, speak to him, talk to him. You know, as you see in the scripture that God was able to speak to the patterns of, of different couples, he can speak to us today, he can speak to your father today. Take him before God and pray for him. And you know, if he goes wherever he goes and then he makes a mistake, for example, you, you told him not to do that deal and then he goes ahead and then he knocks, the deal goes bad. When he comes back, don't begin to tell him, oh, you see, I told you, he didn't listen to me. So Miko told me, he didn't listen to me. You better listen to me. Now. No, when, when you come to your husband, not to your head, to your leader, like that, he actually, I mean, to them, majorly, <laughs> they have this ego. That ego will simply take them far. They will simply distance themselves from you. But a wise woman or a, or a person who understands the second level of the nation, because this works even in our places of work. It works even with men. If you have your boss, if you have the people that are ahead of you, how do you respond to them? If they make a mistake, how do you do it? How do you reach out to them to help them realize and see you know, their problem and bring them to repentance and bring them to that place where they have to correct where they did go wrong? It requires wisdom. In other words, if they knock, what do you do? Do you tell them, okay, I told you, you did this, and look at this, look at this, look at this, and they will go further. You know, but it's better when you tell them, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry about that, uh, that went wrong, but let's believe God for another, let's give God for another opportunity, sorry about that. I know God will do something for us. I mean, you need to find a certain way so that they know you are not against them, you are for them. They just need to listen. That will help them to come back the second time. So when they are doing something else another time, they will be able to come back and consult to you. So what is the point here? The point here is that the second dimension of submission requires wisdom. I always tell men, women, it's okay. Yes, of course, the women always bring it forward. You know, how do you submit a man who's not doing this? How do you submit a man who's not doing this? That's okay, the same. How do you submit to a boss who you see is doing the wrong thing? How do you submit to your boss, to your leader, to your wife? That you know is going the wrong way. You know, how do you do that? It requires wisdom. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, now let us look at the wisdom that we need. To do so, I said, one, pray to God. And two, how do you help out? I want us to look at some of the examples in the scriptures that will help us to see this very well. There are two examples in the scripture. Number one, we are going to read the uh, read the two, Mr. Blitz. And uh, yeah, we read to um, and I'll see how to end this. When you go to the Bible and the book of uh, Second Samuel chapter twelve. Second Samuel chapter twelve. Uh, we're going to begin from verses 1 to 13 in the New Kingdom's version. Second Samuel chapter 12, and verses 1 to 13. Actually, this is a story. It says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in the city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little oil lamb which he had bought and nudged, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his person, and it was like a daughter to him. Now, before I continue, let me explain the Bible and the scripture. The Bible and the scripture is a place where uh, David, the king, had sinned against the Lord. First of all, he, he committed adultery with. Uh, Beersheba, the wife of Uriah, and when he committed adultery, he wanted to cover his sin, and he killed Uriah. And when he killed Uriah, he took Beersheba, that is the mother of Solomon, as his wife. And now the word of the Lord comes to Solomon, and when the man to Nathan, prophet Nathan, when the, Lord of, the word of the Lord comes to prophet Nathan as a prophet, you see, God did not tell prophet Nathan what to say to David. He simply told him, my servant has sinned. I want you to go and talk to him. Now, it was up to Prophet Nathan to know how to speak. He had to look for the word. He had to look for wisdom. He had to see how can I speak to David and he understand his mistake and he repent from his mistake. 
you know, because a particular story happened before with John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 14, you read on your own. In Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 10, you read. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 10. It's a particular story. You know, during that time there was John the Baptist who was a preacher of righteousness and then his way of message, the way he preached was about repentance and shit. You understand? Some of the things he was saying like, okay, you sons of serpents, who told you to run away from the wrath of God? You know, he preached and people are coming to get born again. People, many of you are coming to be baptized. And now he's calling them sons of snakes and serpents. Who told you to run away from the... You know, that was the message of John the Baptist. And now, God gives them a message about the king. The king also had committed adultery and so sort. You know, and when he committed about this king uh, during that time, he took the message to the king, and he goes with the same tone, with the same language. At the end of the story, actually, John the Baptist's head was cut off. Why? Because he didn't know how to bring forward the message that God had given him. Now, going back to Prophet Nathan, he's a man of God, the man of God David had sinned, and, uh, you know, it was over. But as a prophet, he had to find words to use to get the attention of David. At least his head, you know, <laughs> was also to be cut off. What happens here? Look at verses uh, 4. It says, And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own cloak and from his own heart to prepare one of his uh, wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greater arose against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this, that is David. Now, when David heard this story, <laughs> he got angry. He got angry and judged himself. He did not actually was judging himself. So David's anger was greater aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Praise the name of the Lord. And says, And he shall restore fourfold for the Lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed the Uriahs and the, the Hittites with a sword. You have taken... Now, uh, I want to go to the last verse. Okay, let me touch to verse 11. It says, that says the Lord, behold, I will rise up and verse, okay, I'm going to see you from your own house. Uh -huh. Let's, let me go to verse 12. For you did it secretly, but I'll do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David, I have 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. What am I trying to talk about? I'm trying to bring out a story where there is this other of God, Prophet Nathan, he has a message to bring to his leader, the king, David. You know, it's about the mistake that David has done. It's about a sin that David has committed. But how do you speak to your king and bring him to a place of repentance? There's the name of the Lord. Now, because of wisdom, Nathan was able to bring David to that place of repentance. I want to give you another one part for example. And uh, in the book of First Samuel chapter 25, to show you the wisdom that it requires in the second dimension of submission. How do you submit to your friend? Now, if you talk about the context of marriage, how do you do this submission? Okay? When it comes to the second dimension of submission, because the first one we read, we've seen what it is, and we're looking at the second. First, uh, did I say first? Yes. First Samuel 25. First Samuel 25. I want us to begin from verses uh, 1 again. Okay, in the making of the Bible says, okay, let me first give you also the story. The story behind this is, is, is about uh, uh, a man called Nabo and uh, a wife that was called Abigail. And David, by this time, who was, you know, in brackets, a rebel, who had run away from Saul and was, you know, 
he was he was he was hiding in the up countries all the places where Saul would not find him. And as he did so, uh, the Bible tells us that actually Nabal was very rich, and because he was very rich, he had a lot of animals. And according to the way people used to do this kind of business, it was that they could be in one place and pasture or food for the animals uh, is over. So what they could do, because by that time they had settled down, they had built houses and they were living in houses, they couldn't move away and go somewhere else, but they could send the shepherds to go to other lands or places where there is food for the animals. And sometimes they could stay there for a year or month. And as they stayed there for years or month, some of the shepherds didn't come back home because they were attacked by robbers or they were attacked by wild animals, some of them died and so on and so forth. And so it happened that every now and then if the shepherds you sent to go and take care of animals, they come back safely, you know, you make a party for them. You select the animals for them and they eat meat and they celebrate because they came back safe with the animals. That's where this story is coming from. And I want you to look at the story. So the Bible says then Samuel died, Samuel died and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. So David was in the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Mo whose business was in Kama and the man was very rich. The Bible says he was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was sharing his sheep in Kama. And the name of the man was Nabu. And the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful. I want, to take, I want you to take note of that. The Bible gives you what comes first. The Bible is talking about good understanding before beautiful appearance. Good understanding, wisdom. We're talking about wisdom. And, and then different appearance. But the man was harsh. That was Nabu and evil in his doings. Now, there's a woman with understanding, beautiful appearance, is married. <laughs> wow. Is married to a man who's harsh and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Karen. Verses 4. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabu was sharing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Kano, go to Nabu, and greet him in the name, in the name, eh? and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you are, are doing the, the stuff of, of, of celebrating. Your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them. Okay? David says, okay, when your shepherds were with us, we protected them. We kept them. We treated them well. We are not like the rebels. What rebels do to such, you know, kind of business? We did know that. Okay? Ask the young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes. So we come on a feast today. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servant and to your son, David. He even made himself a son. He said, you, I'm your son. I'm your son. So when David and the young men came, they spoke to Nabu according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Then Nabu answered David's servant and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat? that I have killed for my shares and give it to men when I do not know where they are from. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back. And they come and told him all the words. Then David said to his men, Every man greet, every man greet on your sword. So every man greeted on his sword, and David also greeted on his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the settlers. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, one of the young men told Abigail. It means that when the messengers from David came to tell Nabal, Abigail didn't know about it. You know, she was doing her business the other side, and Nabal sent message back to David. 
Okay, verse 14 says, the Bible says, Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messenger from the wilderness to greet our master, and he revealed him. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them. When we were in the fields, they were a war to us both by night and by day, all the time. We were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. <laughs> I'm giving an example of a certain man here who is very funny. But he has a wife who is wise, you see. But Abigail made him haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep, a leather dress, five sides of roasted grain, one hundred cluster of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, Go on before me, see, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabo. Hallelujah. Now, uh, we're talking about wisdom. <laughs> we're talking about wisdom, how to deal with certain things. Uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about, but uh, let me read the story. Let me continue. Says, so it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went down under cover of the hill. And there were David and his men coming down towards her, and she met them. Now David said, now David had said, Surely in vain I protected all that his foe has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so, and more also to the enemies of David. If I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Now when, David, when Abigail saw David, she hastened, look at one woman, she hastened to be smelled from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. She, so she fell at the feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please, let your maid servant speak in your ears. Now look at the wisdom that this woman is using to speak. We're talking about the second level of, of the, the second dimension of submission, the wisdom it requires, especially in places where you see your suggestions, your insights, your reason has not been listened to, yet you had God. Of course, we saw something that Rebecca did because he had God. You know, he did something. He, he made sure that he continues with the, with the program as the Lord as, as God spoke to him. Now, we are also seeing something else. We are seeing another wisdom here. We are also seeing, we saw wisdom with David and Nathan. Now, we are seeing wisdom here of a wife dealing with a man who didn't know what to do. Hallelujah. What happens here? It says, fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. So she fell to his feet. Verses uh, 24. So she fell at his feet and said, O me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be, and please let your maid servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maid servant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel, <laughs> Nabo, for as his name is, so is he. Nabo is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maid servant, did not see the young man of my Lord, whom you saw. Truth should be true. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, I, 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 I want people to see this. I want to see the wisdom here. What wisdom this woman is using? Now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as noble. Look at 27. And now this present which you made servant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maid servant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Praise the name of Now listen to that. Nabo, <coughs> he never understood David. Of course, he knew about how David was anointed and how God used David. Of course, he knew about it because over Jerusalem, they knew he killed Gorias, they knew, and women used to sing about how he killed 10,000, and so killed a thousand, you know, those kinds of things. And somehow he knew that actually the hand of God is upon this man. But Nabo never respected that. You know, 
there's a wisdom that requires to respect, to understand that actually this is your head. That is the better understand that actually I have to speak to my head a certain way. It is important. And I always tell young women, single women, who are not yet married, that if you feel, if you if a man approaches you and they say they want to marry you, and you feel you can't submit to them a certain way as your head, leave that man to go. Otherwise, you may cause problems and trouble for yourself. The Bible talks about a place where God does not minister to unsubmitted women. It says angels will not submit to do not serve them. And when it talks to men, in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says to men, leave. It says, consider the weaker. Okay? And leave under the, under vision, under call, under mandate. That is on that. Praise the name of God. He began to recognize that. So the Bible says, and now, this presence which your maid servant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young man of God. Please forgive the trespass of your maid servant. Uh huh. Anyway, because my Lord, uh huh. Look at that. For the Lord will certainly, the verses 28, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Look at that. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the band of the Lord, with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out. Remember the sling? How is the cave glass with the sling? As from the pocket of the sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good. Oh, that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, praise the name of the Lord. But this will be no grief to you, no offense to your, to your heart, to my Lord, either that you have, you know, have shed blood without cause. All that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt with, with my Lord, then remember, you made servant. David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord the God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hasted and come to meet me, surely by morning light no male would have been left to marry. So David received from her hand what she had bought him, and said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have heard your voice and respected your person. Look at this. David was, I mean, Abigail was able to turn the man who was going to do something that was very bad. So David here is thanking God for Abigail, for the wisdom that was upon her life. And later on, as you continue down on what the Bible says, actually, Nabo uh, died. And when he died, David sent word to Abigail. And actually, that is how Abigail became the wife of David. David said, ah, yeah, 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 I can't leave such a woman with such wisdom. A woman who knows what to say, what to speak, how to recognize, you know, their head, how to recognize the anointing, how to recognize, you know, the leader or the person that is ahead of them, to know how to speak about the call of their life, the mandate of their life, you know. Praise the name of the Lord. That was something very powerful. To be a said something and said, if women simply understand how to deal with men, men are very easy to deal with. We are very easy to do this. It's something small. We are not complicated sometimes like as women. <laughs> hey, that women, you study them over and over. You keep on studying. Every seven years they change. You keep on studying. Men, they are very simple things. Very simple things. That ministers to them. Praise the name of the Lord. Maybe, let me read the last scripture here. And I finish. First Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 1. I'm talking about ministering. To one another, and I've been speaking about a place of ministry and through submission. One of the places, of course, there are lots, but we need to speak about that. Since I spoke about men, I've not talked about the place of uh, uh, the other things that men need to do in ministry to their lives. But let me finish with this. In first Peter chapter 1, verse 3, amplified version from verses 1. The Bible says, In like manner, you married women, 
human woman be submissive to your own husband, subordinate yourself as being secondary to and dependent on them, and adapt yourself to them as to so that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over not by discussion. They are not won over by discussion, but by the godly lives of their lives. Now, when we talk about the word discussion here, if you read deep about this word about discussion, it's not talking about a place where you don't talk about issues. It's talking about a place where you have to, you know, to debate, and, you know, about something. Someone is saying, me, I want this one, you are saying that one. No, that's not what we've been talking about. So when the Bible says men are not one over, they talk about the place of submission, and men say to man. Men are not won over by discussion, but by godly lives of their wives to you who is married and to who is planning to get married. This is one of the secrets here. Men are not won over by discussions. They may not be won over by your words. They are won over by godly lives of their wives. And the Bible says, verses 2, when they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourself together with your reverence, your husband, the way you reverence them, the way you, you, you know, you reverence them, you honor them. It says, now, the Bible begins to explain how you reverence your husband. It says, you are to feel for him. All that reverence include to respect, okay, to defer, to revere him, to honor, to esteem. The Bible says, appreciate. One of the things that ministers mean is to be appreciated. There is no man who does not feel ministered to if he is appreciated. Praise the name of the Lord. Still we find many men, <laughs> oh, when they come in counseling, one of the things they complain about, that even if I do what, this woman doesn't appreciate, this woman doesn't appreciate, so they don't appreciate. One of the problems that <laughs> comes in mind is the place of appreciation. It says, to appreciate, to prize. How do you see your husband? What do you say about him? How do you, what do you call him? What name do you call him? How do you, you know? As simple as this, to prize him. And in the human sense, the Bible says to adore him. We are talking about ministering to one another. One of the places, I mean, we are talking about one of the places, how you can minister to man, how you can minister to your husband. You know, it talks about a place where you adore him. That is to admire him, a place where you admire him, a place where you praise him and be devoted to him, be deeply in love to him, and enjoy, the Bible says, enjoy your husband. Praise the name of the Lord. Verses 3, the Bible says, Let not your yours be the mere external adorning with elaborate interweaving and knotting of the hair, the waving of jewel, or changes of clothing, but let it be the inward adorning and the beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible and unfeeling charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, which is not anxious or wrought up, but is very precious in the sight of God. Hallelujah. I cannot continue because of time. Our time is first spent. We are supposed to finish at 8.30, including the questions. What I wanted to bring out today, of course, there is a lot in Ephesians. We're not going to get to verse 23. I've not explained the place where the Bible says, submit your husband as unto the Lord, because that is the responsibility. You know, it's a place of ministry. It's a place of serving husband to be called as the Lord, you know, to be in that picture of the Lord. And then how do you submit to the Lord who has weakness? Because the Lord Jesus Christ does not have weakness. But how do you submit to the Lord who has weakness? You understand? That's another place. You know, then when you come to the husband as the Lord, what is expected of you? When the scripture says, love your wife exactly as Christ loved the church. Now, I've not handled that because of time. But if you get another day, Mr. Bobby will handle that area also. As the as Lord allows us to do this. Mr. Alan Tuesday, time is <laughs> not on our side. So, I beg to stop here today and uh, maybe ask a few questions. Uh, 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 yes, a man of God, uh, uh, Pastor Samina, we are so happy and, and honored to, 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 to have you online. So many things have, have come up and you've tackled so many questions and, and so many things and topics in marriage. And as Papa OPM put some of the questions together, I just wanted to 
to draw certain lines. Thank you so much. You've, <laughs> you've sorted that clear issue that indeed the, the Bible put it clear. The woman of wisdom and understanding then duty. Uh, it gives a guideline to, to us men on what to look out as, 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 as we look out for, for, for women to marry. But also you, 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 put, you put it clear that how will God talk to you about marriage if you not get cultivated that position where you hear God and other things. Because sometimes the women tell us, but the man had, and you ask him, but did you hear for yourself also? So how will God talk to you about marriage if actually <laughs> you don't cultivate that position? A uh, man of God, uh, Pastor Sam, as a uh, PM put the questions together, I wanted to draw certain things to you. One, uh, if you can just stay around uh, for five minutes to talk about a finance. This has been an issue coming up. How do these people submit their finances together? When people come to us and they come, because this come, this come money is for men, this come money is for women. <laughs> how, do they, how do they reconcile? Because we are coming from different backgrounds, so that is one of the issues. Uh, so the, also the other issue is that I think this has been affecting men so much. We are men, uh, mm. uh, 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 um, should I uh, should I say uh, uh, intimidated by the, the, the successfulness of women? And you know sometimes the women are moving faster, maybe they're doing better in certain areas. And actually, some men don't support their careers or don't support their uh, their success. And you know, marriages are, are pushed to a certain level. How would you advise men or women in their way to handle this success on either side? But also, uh, um, a man of God, there's been also this issue of. Of, of dating, I've, I've met um, some guys in church. You know, we are, we are tired of dating church guys. When they go for dating, they want to speak about scriptures. They don't buy uh, flowers. They want to bring these mysteries. It's time for Valentine. We want to see some of the flowers. So we are ending up uh, dating a men out of church. Yet, my child, they know that it's supposed to be born again people. And, and that has been so, uh, so, so much of a controversy. And lastly, uh, the other issue that came up, None of God was, I, I know it's not the time to talk about Holy Communion, but briefly, uh, the context has been um, boys and some people are specializing the, the Holy Communion part. They are, they are not attending to it, uh, to the expectation, uh, they expected to, to attend to it. So I wanted to draw those four aspects as the pastor, as Papa OPM organizes his questions. So one is finances, how the finances are handled, the success of each other. Uh, the dating part and, and maybe the, the Holy Communion part of what you saw. Can you repeat finances? Uh, uh, yes, dating. finances. The dating. dating. Uh, how, why and, uh, the why the church people being, yes, success of the wife or the other couple and they're failing to handle that success or supporting their women in their career and in their endeavors. Holy Communion and then, uh, yeah, those four issues. Yes, sir. Okay, finances again with. Now, the Bible in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, the Bible says, As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. The Bible says subject in everything. Now, everything does not have a Greek deeper meaning. <laughs> it's simple English here. Everything is everything. Praise the name of the Lord. It is everything to their husband. This subject in everything to their husband. But also to begin with is the place of the understanding of the two shall become one. If you don't understand, if you don't understand the revelation of two shall become one, finances become a problem. But they cannot become a problem if you know that actually you are one. It means you have one vision to build, you have one family to build. Okay, if you have one family to build and one vision to build, uh, it's the place of a helper suitable in Genesis. You know, look at what happened. You know, God gave man a mandate. He gave him assignment. He told him what to do. He put him in a garden. He said, turn the garden. He first gave him a job to do. And when he gave him a, a job and a mandate of a vision to do, then he says a woman needs a help. A man needs a helper to help him. Praise the name of the Lord. So it doesn't matter how much money as a wife you make, you must understand they are in that place of a helper suitable. The Bible didn't say that your help, being a helper suitable, you are limited to the areas of bed, Holy Communion. It didn't say that, okay, she's a helper suitable as far as Holy Communion is concerned. No, she's a helper, you're a helper suitable in everything. Praise the name of God. I tell women, we should feel so proud that 
in everything you are able to help your husband. You feel that actually you are fulfilling the understanding of the place of being a helper suitable. You should not feel suited that actually you are contributing to the well-being of that home. Okay, you are contributing to this, you are contributing to that, you are contributing to this, and that, and that, and that. You should not feel cheated. Because what is the ministry of help are suitable? Of course, it's different where the man doesn't care at all. If a man doesn't care at all, it's like, ah, so long as my wife brings in, I don't care at all. That is different. But if, if a husband is doing their best to see to it that actually you build that vision, you have that family, you have that life to run, not an other. If you don't want to bring your finances or submit your finances, what are you building with that money? What other life do you have except this one? So if we talk about ministry, you're doing it together. If we talk about what? Career business? What, what business? You, why, why do you begin to do a business where a husband is not? That is divorce. You have not done that when you are single. And you don't mean you're single and do that. The Bible says two are better than one. The Bible says in their work, in their wealth. We read that in the Exodus, chapter 4, verses 9. It's very clear. It says share the work. Share the wealth. Share the work. Share the wealth. As simple as that. So if you feel cheated as a woman to bring in your finances, to submit your finances to your husband, then you do not understand what it means to be a helper suitable. You don't have a revelation thereof. You should feel so proud that even in finances, you are able to help your husband. It will be something that you'll be, you'll be happy about, you know. Again, look at that place, because when we come to the place of submission, it is a place, um, I mean, God has given your husband a place where if he tells you not to go and work, if that man chooses to make your working life hard, okay, they make your working life hard, they don't want you to go and work, they say, okay, stay home, what I've been home will be enough, let's do that. And, and so on and so, and you're like, okay, it's not enough, I need to go and work, and so on and so If you go to work, when your husband says, don't go and work, that is disobedient. And one of the things is that the angels will not mean for you. So your husband allowing you to go and work, to give you peace to go and work, to support you in your career and what you are doing, still that is a very powerful and beautiful contribution. You know, that brings and then takes me to the place of men who feels, you know, who feels bad when their wives are succeeding or they are going, uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes more successful per se, as people say, than them. But she can't be successful than you because you are one. That success is for both of you. When she's successful, you are successful. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, look at Jesus Christ. <laughs> when he did go to heaven, he gave us gifts, he anointed us, and he has called us to a place to go and do much more than he did. That is the mind of Christ. Remember where I began from. He says, learn from me. Learn from me. Learn from me. You'll find rest for your soul. He is at a place where he will love to see as a great leader, as a great leader, as a great leader, as a great leader. He wants to see that the people he came to save, they are better off. The people he came to save, they do even great things than he did you and us. How in this world do you feel uncomfortable that your wife is more successful than you? That is demonic. It is being evil. Somebody say, man, of course, it comes as a result where some women do not understand their place. But okay, that they are called to submit. They are called to subject themselves in everything. They are called to be helpers, suitable. They are anointed for that. They are ordained for that. And it is a, a, a gift. It's, 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 it's actually an advantage that they are being able to support, to help, you know, to be helpers, suitable to their husband in everything. To me, any woman, what I would tell any woman, feels so proud. Praise the name of the Lord. But this thing of cassette kamchara, it's not this is woman is money. I tell people, what do you call woman is money? Does it have a woman? That money has a picture of a woman on it that you call it a woman is money? No. If you begin to make money and, and you want to do things away from your husband, or your husband begins to do things away from the wife, you begin to build a house without the knowledge of your wife, or without the hand or support of your wife, or without the consent of your wife, what are you doing? That is divorce. 
He made vows, and the vow, one of the lines in the vows is simple. He simply said, with my body I honor you, and all that I have I share with you. The Bible says, two cannot work together unless they agree. In other words, if you begin even to divert finances and say, this is my money, the other one is the other money, this is, you know, what are you building that I'm not part of? A part of? What are you building? You started to divorce without marriage. You know, divorce does not begin on the day he says, I'm divorcing you. It begins on those things. You know, when you begin to put your money aside, say, this is where I'm a child, when that money becomes that much, it sends you to do things without your husband. And that is the beginning. The enemy takes hold of us. The Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold. In the book of Ephesians chapter 46, it says, do not give him an opportunity where he holds himself. Because we do it about, I mean, we do it to send you. When that money becomes much, and your wife doesn't know, when it becomes much and your husband doesn't know, the devil knows how to begin to manipulate you. You know, to begin to do things without your husband, begin to do things without your wife, and before you know it, things begin to happen, which are not right. In other words, with finances, submit your finances, put your finances together, work together. You have one life to live. You have one vision to fulfill. Your inheritance is tied together. So every woman never feel, never feel cheated that you, you are being such a helper, even in finances or whatever it is. And then to a man who feels that the success of a wife is a problem, or they don't want to marry successful women. You know, <coughs> being a husband is an anointing. It's ordained. Again, this is why I speak to some men of some women. If you think what makes a man is when he has money, then you've lost it. What makes him a husband is when he has money or when he doesn't have money. You've lost it. No. This is an anointing. God ordained it that way. We are configured that way. It is a grace upon us. When God created us as men, that's why He created us. When He created women as women, He created to be helpers, suitable. It is an anointing. He put it in you. He configured you that way. And I tell people that if you deny a woman a place of being a helper suitable, a place of being able to help, you have denied her the core of her ministry, the place of her service. You've not given her that place where she has to serve. And therefore, she will not live a fulfilled life. She will not live to the extent of what God ordained her to be in that marriage, in her life, if you deny her the opportunity. You know, to be a helper suitable. And then you do things alone. That place where men want to do things alone, you know, want to do, they, they think alone, they decide alone, they do things alone, they, they even decide how they spend the money alone and so on and so forth and everything. You know, they just tell their wife, I'm going to do this, I've done this, I'm going to do this. Going. The woman has nothing to say about that. You know, you've denied her her ministry as a helper suitable. Because in the ministration of a helper suitable is the place of first of all interpretation and the place of, of uh, and the place of implementation, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because if you go deeper and understand the ministry of helps, you understand actually the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the character and the functionality of the Holy Spirit in the marriage relationship. So you can put it this way that actually the woman is the Holy Spirit in the marriage relationship. So if you deny her the opportunity to serve you, to minister to you, to be a helper suitable in everything that you are going to do, you know, she will never function as God ordained her to be. So to men, I mean to men and women, when we talk about a husband, this is an anointing. This is what God ordained. It's not it's nothing that they they are made that if a man has this and this and this no, he's fit to be a husband. Oh, he's made a husband. You understand? No. He's not anointed from us. That thing is the inside of us. It's in the inside of every boy that is born. It just needs to be, you know, uh, activated. It just needs to be need to be called out. It just needs to be informed. When that thing is informed, you know, a man or husband begins to function as he is supposed to be. You know, as the Bible tells us men to evoke the beauty of a woman, you know, there's a beauty that is inside a woman that only man can evoke. If you don't know how to speak a certain way, if you don't know how to live in consideration as a weaker vessel, if you don't know how to 
to, 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 to make a, be a helper suitable to speak the language that God understands to her. You can't evoke a certain beauty, and God is not going to evoke that. That beauty was left for a man to evoke. The same to a woman in the ministration of submission, that if it's until you learn to submit to that man and show him that he is that Lord, when you show him that he is that Lord, you evoke something out of him. You evoke the Lordship in him. You evoke that which is that God ordained him. In other words, there is a responsibility of a woman to evoke what they, to evoke the anointing, the grace that is on that man to be, to, to, to function fully as a husband. And, is, uh, uh, and it is upon a husband to evoke a certain duty in a woman for her to function as a helper suitable. Therefore, I say, as a man, never feel small at the success of your life, unless you don't understand the revelation. The best is continue to, to support her, to stand with her, to pray for her. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, it's that powerful, it's that amazing. And, and also women, understand that position. Understand that position. Being the husband is good ordained. God ordained it that way. You need to provoke it. You need to evoke it. If you don't, your husband, you're the place of just complaining and complaining and complaining. You know, some of the things are the small things that have been discussed in here. But if your wife don't know how to submit a certain way, he will never minister to that man. You never mean that that man. If you don't have submit a certain way, some of the things I've just read in First Peter, the things that brings out a man to be what he is. Look at David, how he was turned by just wisdom from a woman. You know, look at the words the woman spoke. He spoke about, you know, a man who was very annoyed and angry and about to kill. Praise the name of the Lord. He, he brought him and he woke him up and said, you are a man of God. You are a king. God has called you to do this. You know, those are the things that waste up men. You know, when the Bible talks about the ministry of, of helps and goes in the book of, of, of John chapter 16 from verse 7 and talks about the ministry of a helper, comfort, strength, and counselor. Uh, when you look at all that and a woman is able to do that, praise the name of the Lord, you don't understand what it does to man. It is something, it's an illustration that when it comes to any man, it doesn't matter how he looks like, it doesn't matter where he is, you know, he will wake up. You see that? Therefore, when the, when the Bible says, if, if uh, anyone uh, of the scripture says, he, he finds, he finds a good thing and obtains favor from God. Finds a good thing and obtains favor from God. It's the place again to recognize. You know, when you recognize that, when you acknowledge that she's a good thing, she praise the name of the Lord. And when you're a woman, you recognize and understand you a good thing. That's why the woman of the Proverbs, the Bible says she will do her husband good all the days of her life. Because you're a good thing. I tell you, women, if you ever think of evil, if evil crosses your mind, it is not in your nature. It is not in your menstruation. It's not your anointing. When it crosses in your mind, immediately bind it and bury it. Because you are called to minister good all the days of your life to that man. And therefore, know what is that good that I'm supposed to minister. You are the favor, the, you know, that favor that is added on a man. When you come in the life of that man, it's that favor that you need to call out. Praise the name of the Lord. When you're praying for your husband, how do you pray for your husband? You need to tell yourself, I have that favor that God brought to this man, and because I'm married to this man, things will work out. Things are working out. Things, you know, things must work. This man is favor. This man is a great man. This man, you know, when the Bible talks about the woman, the precious woman says the husband is born in the gates. Can you see that? Because there was something of this woman. There are things that she did. There are things that she needs to do and to align. And when she did that, one of the things that we see, the husband was not the guest of the sister. Why? Because you come with an anointing of favor. If you go get to the word favor, it means a lot of things. Blessings, favor, you know, it's a lot of things. So the understanding of these things, you know, if they told me if I'm sorry, you've taken in something else now. We have talked about finances, we talked about okay, dating, 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 dating. <laughs> Praise the name of God. Okay, let me begin on the side of, of men. Now, men, 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 men in church. Yeah, sometimes when we get born again, 
there's a way we think about certain things and we think most probably they are so kind of, uh, they are not spiritual, they are what, but I told you the rule here is every single day is of God. If it's good and can minister to a soul, it is of God. Again, it requires a, a place where men need to study these things. They need to have knowledge about some of these things. Yes, sometimes men think women are being so emotional, they are being carnal. They are not being carnal. No, they have a certain nature. There's a way God created them. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. That's why sometimes they call them flowers. <laughs> it's the way God created the woman. There are things that they love. There are things that they need. There are things that they see. It's not just being canon. It's just that sometimes men don't understand women. They don't understand women. Sometimes they don't understand how they communicate. Sometimes, you know, women are detailed. Men, the way we think, <laughs> sometimes, oh my God, my God, my God, we, we just think in general. We don't think in detail. We think in general. We don't think in detail. Uh, and therefore, the place of not understanding who women are, sometimes it makes Christian men uh, in the place of not what they call being romantic enough, but also romanticism needs to have a certain limit uh, because the Bible says do not awaken love before it is due. If you awaken love, <laughs> you cause problems when it's not time for you to be awakened. Praise the name of God. So sometimes when we want to be romantic, we cope the world and we want to do it the world way. And when we do it the world way, of course the consequences is that of the world. And that's what will happen. But we need to look out the biblical way to do this. Otherwise I'll say to men, Please study there are books. For example, there's a book like Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. That's a good book. It's a good book to help you understand women. A little bit, you know. You understand a certain piece of them. Praise the name of the Lord. So I wouldn't say that actually what women, these women want, it's it's canon. Uh, uh, no, it's not canon. It's good for them. It ministers to them. So I will say to men that when we, we go into speaking tongues and then we speak in general, for us the picture is one marriage, and when the picture is one marriage, uh, to them they want to feel these things that brings marriage. For you, when the picture comes marriage, uh, you go to this woman, I love you, and that is it. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But the woman wants to see the details that shows that you love her. <laughs> they are detailed to that point. I want to show the bit that shows that you love her. The man's like, I told you I love you, I love you. You know, and, and it's totally, sometimes, blunt, I mean, it's blunt to a woman, is what I'm talking about. But also, let me come to the women. That place of, of, of betting. I mean, I don't understand the place of a woman thinking a man who does not have God will ever love them better. It is impossible. They don't have it. They can't give it to you. Yes, they'll give you these flowers and so on and so forth when they're just looking at one thing. And that's why after using you, they dump you. They throw you away. You know, you understand what I'm saying? They don't have it. I don't think. I <laughs> praise the name of the Lord. You know, I was aware where I was still like, and when I was growing, and I was getting, of course, in that stage of getting married, there was a young girl who most probably wanted to see me romantic in the way they define romanticism. But, you know, this wasn't my girlfriend, that she was my girlfriend. She wasn't that I'm dating her or kind of thing, but most probably she tried out some things, and I, I was not responding to them. And so she asked me one day, she said, but do you have feelings? That is the name of the Lord. Do you even have feelings? You know, I was... This uh, youth leaders, you know, leading this whole group of young people and so on and so forth. So she said, you have feelings? I said, yeah, I have feelings. I praise the name of the Lord. But I didn't want to work in love when it's not yet time for it. And to a wrong person. You get what I'm saying? And then I told her, you know, when I find the person I want to marry, that's when I will show you that I have feelings. You will see that I have feelings. So what am I saying to women? In the first place, please, a man who do not know God a certain way, they will never love you. 
unless if you're looking for only kind of love. But true love begins with agape. They don't have a revelation of agape. They don't have even understand agape. These other things you can teach them. You can teach them slowly by slowly. They can learn. You know, they can learn. Because if you look at the churches where we came from, <laughs> the generation where we were, especially the generation where me, I grew up in church, the way I grew up in church, the generation where I had to grow up. I mean, of course, I was a youth in the world, and then I got saved at around, I got saved when I was around 19, 20, 19, 20 years. That's when I got saved. And uh, I come to church, and the things they were telling us in church, that we were supposed to be little girls, and what are they, really, really, and so many other things. They could not allow us to relate a certain way. And you find that actually up to today there is a certain there are certain things they teach. And when they teach them that way, you know, we end up taking up that. And most of them we don't know better. But if you teach us, if you teach that man, he will learn. Praise the name of the Lord. He wrote that husband. Now lastly, Holy Communion. <laughs> Now, the Holy Communion thing, of course, we read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, from verses 4, where the Bible says, the body, your body belongs to your husband, and the body of your husband belongs to you. In the message version, it says, marriage is not a place, stand up for your rights. <laughs> rights, rights, rights. And there is a decision to serve the other, and says, whether in bed, it begins with bed, <laughs> and outside bed. Praise the name of the Lord. One of the problems is that place where, where you get married and you still want to cling on your body. The place of clinging to your body brings problems because it's no longer your body. What am I saying? That when the other party makes that body, you still call it your body. And because you also want to wait to feel that you need Holy Communion in order to give in Holy Communion, then you are not ministering to that person. We find actually that Paul was addressing one of the problems while saying, in order to avoid fornication, let a man have their own uh, husbands. Let every man have their own wives, and every wife has every woman have a husband. In others, one of the ways that God gave in order to, to stop people from sinning against sin, especially in the sin of fornication, it is that place. And now this man or woman commits himself to this girl or commits himself to this man and they don't want to serve them fully in that area. I tell young men and women, if you are not ready for this ministration, leave that man alone. And here I also speak to the way men are wired and women. To us men, when it comes to Holy Communion, it's a thing. You know, we don't go through cycles. We are like women go through cycles. Of course, is that place where men also have to learn to do it. There's a certain book, there's a full book about that. There's a book called The Act of Marriage. You need to read that book. It helps a lot. Sometimes men don't want to read. They think they know. They don't want to read. They think they know. Read this book, it will help you a lot. Praise the name of God. The Act of Marriage. It's a beautiful book. A piece written by Christian authors. You know, that are, speak about these things very well. So, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about a place where men don't go through these cycles. It's, uh, it's one of the things. Because when God created us, men, that's how he created us. But for us to get tuned on, it is very, very easy. And now you, woman, you are committing yourself to the place of ministering to that man in that area. And then you reach there, and then you don't want to do it. What, what, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What were you thinking? What, were you, what, what are you doing to this man? That's why when you read the scriptures down there, the Bible says, even in the place of not being together for some time, the Bible, if you read the message version, not the New, uh, 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 new Living Translation, it says, do that for a limited time. But in this ministration, it has to be for a limited time to abstain away from one another, to be separate from away from another. It has to be from a limited time. You know, if Apostle Paul, who was Single, you know, understood this means mystery. Yet he, he was a eunuch of a certain sort, but he understood it. I don't know how he, he was able to do that, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, he talks about a place where the devil can actually tempt people. He to be saved. 
So it says, do, do not do this for a long time. It says, do this for a limited time so that Satan did not tempt you. And then, when people get married and when they get married, because sometimes the women go through these cycles and whatever, they aren't thinking about men, they aren't thinking about this man, and sometimes this, they want this man to fight for this thing. One of the things that I want to tell women, one of the things that you must learn and understand, never let your husband fight for this. When they fight for this, <laughs> praise the name of the Lord, and they feel it's one of the things that makes a man feel is not needed. It's one of the things that makes a man, if he has to beg for this, if he has to fight to get it, you know, he, he makes he feels that it is not needed. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So it is it's a place where as a woman you must understand the way God created us. The way God created men. So if you say I do and you're giving yourself to this man, Please know this is one of the administrations that you need to go into and be willing to do. Not when you feel, okay? When the other party feels, that's the place. When the other party feels, have them. Because that body no longer belongs to you. That's why God made sure that here he put an instruction saying that body does not belong to you. It belongs to the other. Let's minister to your partner. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't come to, I mean, you don't have to wait for the place where you are feeling that you need it to give to your partner. It's not about you, it's about the other party. In others, make a buy, be available for the other party, serve the other partner, because that is one of the reasons why the Bible says get married. It's <laughs> in order to avoid fornication. Let people marry, one of you is marry. You get what I'm saying? Uh, so, to say all this kind of things, to put them together, because it's a place of men also knowing, getting to know how to go about this. Because sometimes men also don't know how to go about this, and when, uh, and, and, and when they just want to do whatever they do, and then they are, they are done, and then they leave, their, they leave their wives in a state that is not good, and when they live in a place where they are not good, actually some women come to a place of hating this act. And when they hate it, it's one of, uh, uh, they hate it simply because the husband didn't know what to do, and possibly even the wife doesn't know how to help, or the husband doesn't listen, and because he doesn't listen, so problems come around that thing. But it is one of the sweetest things. It's one of the best things that can ever happen to a couple, to have a good and satisfying. If you look at the message version, it speaks about a place of satisfying one another. It speaks about a place of satisfying. In other words, the mind to eat when you are engaging with it is the place where you must satisfy. And to satisfy one another is an art. You need to study, you need to read, you need to ask questions so people, this people that can help you in that area because it's important. Important to the man as well as the woman. Praise the name of the Lord. So that you don't miss out on this. Eh? Oh, man of God, I don't know. <laughs> Those are big things. I, 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 yes, uh, uh, Pastor Sam, thank you so much. Actually, uh, the people have raised uh, an issue that may not go into the question, but for you to give us a promise that maybe we'll host you for part two or part three. And I wanted to hear that promise from you that man of God, you'll be available in case we call on you for part two so that you can be able to answer all the other questions. Because you've actually tackled many of the things. So we want to plead and ask you, man of God, Pastor Sam, that uh, uh, whenever you'll be available, sir, we'll call you for part two so that you continue from there, sir. If it is okay with you, sir. Whatever we are invited to Sam, we will serve. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, when you started the submission, man of God will say that. Let the singles first understand that if you want marriage, it is about serving. So when you emphasize the serving of the body, that was very clear. We are here to serve. So that many of the questions, man of God is tackled, but I wanted you to do two things. 
one, uh, you've already assured us that you'll be coming for part two. Thank you so much. Two, uh, one of the things on the, on the dust preparing is the Saturday we usually talk about marriage and family. And actually, every day on this prayer line, we have a marriage hour, 1 to 2 p.m., led by the man of God, uh, uh, Papa OPM. He always talks about marriage. And, and actually, when we invited you, we knew that uh, uh, your coming will also be launching uh, as a marriage and family day that Saturday. Here we come and talk about marriage. So, man of God, we are asking you one thing, one to pray for that launching, but also to take off time to pray with us regarding marriages, those who are intending to marry, and families as led. So we just hand over to you to pray for us and and, and go to the marriage hour. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we want to thank you for giving us life. And we want to thank you for the institution of marriage, for the beauty of marriage. We want to thank you for those that are married, oh God, for their marriages. How we declare and declare to the glory and honor the name of Jesus. Each one of us will understand this less. When the Bible speaks about this ministry, it says it is a ministry, it's a great mystery. There are two great mysteries in the scriptures. The great mystery about marriage and the mystery about godliness. And then as I pray in the name of Jesus, that as we launch this hour, that it will continue to dig deeper, we will continue to, 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 to learn, we will continue to to receive understanding and revelation into the things so that glory and honor of the name of Jesus. Thank you for the single people that are here and these things before they even enter marriage. But Lord of glory, they have a very big opportunity. So many people entered marriage without understanding and knowing these things. They are just getting to know these things. And we know that as they keep on listening and they keep on giving themselves to these things, Yes, a lot of things is going to be done in their lives, in their marriages. We bless you that this uh, ministry is going to do, is going to reach many, and it's going to impact lives, it's going to change families, it's going to change master king of perspective in the world, it's going to disciple the nation. In the name of Jesus, I declare and declare that marriages, of, 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 of marriages that are going to come out of this altar, might as we will be an example throughout the world that every one of us might as well be able to teach that each one of us, so oh God, there will be an example that people look at in the name of Jesus and understand the mystery of marriage. Thank you, Lord, that this institution is blessed. Thank you, the launch, and the launch of this, that's going to go far. It's going to be great. It's going to mentor many to the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. Great and my teachers will come and give us insight to the glory and honor of you. And thank you, Jesus, that all people are blessed. Their children are blessed. Oh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Their children are blessed. They are blessed and they are blessed. We thank you, Lord of glory, that a generation is blessed to the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. Because we can believe. Amen. Thank you so much, Musumba TV. And I want to thank you so much, uh, Musumba Pastor Sam. And I want to thank you for what you have done for us today. Uh, you have broken the fallow ground for us, sir. And uh, that is very integral because of what you have done. You have anointed the place with the wisdom of marriage. And most importantly, because you are an ordained pastor, you have given us the very necessary graces to begin to now dig even deeper, to begin to even operate. And I want to thank you and personally honor you for that. Thank you for coming through. It will be such an opportunity to host a panel to have you on and begin to speak certain things with you. Thank you for taking your time to go through so many things. If I begin to start from the things that hit me, we are not going to get out of here. And I wouldn't want to take your time because of that. But all I can tell you, sir, is I honor you. I honor you. I honor you. I honor you, sir. Thank you so much for your time that you spent. I want you to know that the seed has been sown. And indeed, this is the make manifest we are going to manifest. Sir, once again, I honor you. And this is what we have to say. I mute, I mute, and I send it back to you so much easier.